Hi there guys, it's Christy, and this is a quick video that I am putting on in order to clarify some things that are creating confusion with my Historical Jesus series. I know that mythicists are accustomed to having debates about whether or not a piece of evidence is reliable, and I'm finding a lot of people are just using stock answers in their comments on my video. I think it's important that I restate again what my approach is because I am approaching it from a way that mythicists have not, I don't think, seen it dealt with before. I'm not here to convince you that the historical Jesus can be established by looking at Josephus. That is not my purpose. My whole approach here is that we have this evidence. It exists. And when we read the evidence, and when we read what the texts have to say, and we study them, and we analyze them, what we find is that we observe theological changes over time. For instance, mythicists really don't engage with the fact that there were massive, huge disputes over the nature of Jesus' body in the first two centuries of the early Christian movement. People had very firm views as to whether or not Jesus was completely human, or partially human, or fully divine. The nature of his body, the material substance that his body was made of, is a huge issue. For me, we need to be able to account for that. Let's just take the premise that the historical Jesus didn't exist and he was completely made up. Mythicists still have to be able to account for the fact that we observe these theological fights. And that is the purpose of my series, that we have to be able to account for what we observe. In the last video's comment section, someone wrote that I was objecting to the fact that there are multiple mythical Jesus theories when this person asserted there are multiple historical Jesus theories. This person doesn't understand the difference between data and theory, and so I want to be very clear on what it is that I'm doing in the series. Yes, each gospel author, and Paul, has his own idea of who Jesus was and what he meant and how they communicated those ideas to the community that they were in. Yes, in the data, there are multiple Jesuses. I, I know that. I stipulate that. I have one theory, though, that can account for the observations of why we see differences. Whereas the mythical Jesus theory doesn't have a singular account, the historical Jesus theory does. It can account for the existence of many different Jesuses. But that doesn't mean the theory itself thinks that there were multiple Jesuses. I've tried to map this out in a more visual way, because again, I know that mythical Jesus proponents are just sort of tunnel vision focused on attacking the credibility of Josephus and the gospel writers and Paul, and they just have all of these stock phrases in their heads. But none of those stock phrases are going to help you in this series, guys, because that's not what we're fighting about. We are debating how do we best explain the evidence we observe. So we have all of these ancient writings. Those are our observations. And when we read and we study these texts, we can come up with questions based on observation. For instance, like I did in the first video, why do we see Aramaic remnants in Greek language texts? Another question that I'll be exploring in the next video is, why is it that we see adoptionist theologies, the idea that Jesus was a human being who was adopted by God to be his Messiah or son of God early in the Jesus movement? But by the end of the first century and the start of the second century, Jesus has been transformed into a divine being. How can we account for this change over time? These are all things that, when we look at the fact that the historical Jesus was a Jew who was a monotheist living in the Galilee, and we go through and look at how the religion itself became internationalized and it brought in a lot more pagans, we can use historical facts in conjunction with the theory to account for the shifting theology. In contrast, the problem with having multiple mythical Jesus theories is that each author will provide a different answer to the same questions based on whether or not they think that the Jesus movement was Paul experiencing a celestial being through Revelation, or Jews who were influenced by Stoicism and Philo, or a minimally historical Jesus fused with the Christ of Christianity. Each of these authors is going to look at it in a different way. And you know what? That's fine. That's the whole point of a theory. But the question is, what do they then tell us about the observable evidence? If it was the case that the initial Jesus movement was made up of Jews who were influenced by Stoicism and Philo, how does that explain anything about the use of Aramaic in the text? 
How does that help us explain why Jesus was very corporeal early in the church and becomes increasingly divine as time goes on? These are the questions that have to be answered whether or not you think there is an historical Jesus. The question is which theory best accounts for the observation. And my position is, has been, and until I'm convinced differently, will continue to be the theory that most accurately and consistently explains what we observe in the text is the theory that Jesus was a real person in history who existed, who had real followers, who was a real Jew, who preached a real apocalyptic form of Judaism. That's all I'm trying to do in this series, is make the case that that theory is the best one. I'm sorry for people who have followed along that they feel like I'm restating the obvious. Also, if you didn't understand what I was trying to do, then I apologize for not being more obvious. But either way, I feel like now we are very clear. If someone asks me a question, I'll point them at this video. Having established this fundamental basis of what the series aims to do again, I will now continue working on the video, which at the moment stands unedited audio at 45 minutes. So it's either going to be a two-parter or I'm going to cut a lot out. We'll have to see what happens. But I want to get back to that. So I'm going to let you go. And I guess that means it's time for me to say that I've been Christy. You've been awesome. You'll be seeing my next video either tomorrow or Saturday. And then on Sunday, I have my big old debate happening where I'm going to be defending the sexual revolution and feminists who pushed for it. Orgasms for everybody. <laughs> yeah, that's going to be my whole debate strategy. I'm just going to say that over and over and over again for an hour and a half. No, not really. All right, guys, did I, did I say that I've been Christine? You've been awesome? Because if I haven't, then, you know, we are. <laughs> I'll talk to you again soon. Bye-bye.